possible correlation is an interesting question. So I wonder, since you know, uh, in your travels, does this make sense to you, Terence, on the basis of direct Gnostic experience? You mean that, that we have we traveled in the universe or without it? So are you saying, is it, does it seem reasonable to connect up the entities in the psychedelic experience to particular places in space and time? Yeah, does Rupert's question pertain to direct experience we've already had, or is SETI something we have yet to uh, begin to make contact with these galactic intelligence? Mm -hmm. So the Milky Way would be a good friend to make. Well, I, we've had this discussion before. I've always, I, I, it's hard for me. I can s imagine that the sun is intelligent and an organism, but only if I imagine it exists on that scale in some way that it's fairly hard to relate to. In other words, it's like the Pacific Ocean. I can imagine it to be intelligent. But I, I would imagine that its intelligence is of such a nature that it and I probably don't have too much to do with each other. M meanwhile, out in the universe, somewhere, um, these entities exist which we do contact in the psychedelic experience. I. I've always sort of imagined, well, I'm never sure. I mean, are they creatures of other levels or simply other places? And then if other places, they seem to be places so far away that the laws of physics are different. So it's not just like the difference between Chicago and Memphis. It's like the difference between Chicago and Oz. <laughs> you know, there's an ontological thing going on uh, of incommiserability. Sometimes I think that uh, perhaps, you know, we've talked about how the morphogenetic field is um, a necessary hypothesis, but hard to detect the way you can detect an electromagnetic field, well then uh, the creative response to that is to say, well, perhaps the imagination is the detection of the morphogenetic field, that the imagination is somehow that the mind, the brain-mind system is a quantum, mechanically delicate enough chemical system that incoming input from the morphogenetic field can push these cascades of chemical activity one way or another, and that in the act of daydreaming or psychedelic tripping or something, you're actually scanning the morphogenetic field. Well, in that case, it means that what we call the imagination is actually the universal library of what is real, that you couldn't imagine it if it weren't real somewhere, sometime. And in that, that to me is very empowering, because I think that's, that's the truth that you learn at the center of the psychedelic experience that's so mind-boggling that you can't really return to it with it, that, that it's real. And if, the, if thinking about the heavens in this way as organic, integrated, and animate, makes that more probable, then I'm, I'm all for it. Um, I think, Rupert, you and I, and perhaps to some degree, Ralph, are come out of the influence of the school called organismic philosophy, that Alfred North Whitehead and uh, Joseph Needham and L.L. Uh, L. White put forth. Clearly, the reason that organism, you know, Rupert made the very eloquent case for organismic organization at every level, clearly the reason that's been unwelcome in science is because it raises questions about um, the signal systems which hold these organisms together, and that is pointing back toward a theme that I know is dear to Rupert, he touched on it this evening, which is the systematic 
elimination of spirit from any explanation of what nature is. I mean, a machine communicates mechanical force through uh, direct contact, basically. An organism operates through uh, chemical systems of diffusion or color signal or even language in some cases. So it's these... uh, It's these higher order forms of function, if called down to explain large chunks of nature, that begin to look like a re-infusion of spirit into nature. Strangely enough, this is, of course, exactly what we need. But orthodoxy is fighting, you know, tooth and nail. This is because it's still reacting to the 19th century battle where deism had such power that it appeared potentially capable of frustrating Darwinian rationalism. But that battle was won long ago. Now it's time to realize that trying to reason upward from the laws of atomic physics to organisms is not going to work. That there are what David Bohm and other people, I suppose, called emergent properties at every level. There's nothing magical about that concept. I mean, think of one molecule of water. It's absurd to call it wet. You know, wetness is something that you have when you have millions of molecules of water. It's an emergent property that um, comes out of millions of molecules of water. And at every level in the evolution of physical complexity, Complexity itself has permitted the emergence of new properties with, you know, the iridescence of mind and culture emerging finally uh, at the top of this pyramid. Uh, I don't know. I think it's interesting the way the culture has changed its attitude toward the heavens. I mean... a revolution in our thinking that is fairly fundamental is that uh, no one at this point, I think, believes in uh, the human conquest of space. This has gone from a national commitment in the, 50, in the 60s to the chicest thing you could be into in the 70s on a par with virtual reality and MDMA today to It isn't mentioned, not by freaks like us, not by presidential candidates, not by right-wingers, left-wingers, middle-of-the-roaders, or anybody else. It's all over. The heavy lift launch (coughs) capacity that resided in the Soviet military-industrial complex has been allowed to drift into obsolescence. They held the keys to reaching near-Earth orbit, and it's slipping away. So... uh, it, I appreciate your attempt to animate the cosmos because apparently we're turning in, into the worm dimension. We're turning away from all that. Uh, it, it has become, like so much, a, a part of a past era of grandeur and glory seeming not to be repeated. We held a virtual reality conference here a year and a half ago, and Howard Rheingold had a revelation in the middle of the night down on the platform in front of the big house when he said, my God, now I understand what virtual reality is for. It's to keep us from ever leaving the earth. (laughs) And, uh, you know, it bears consideration. Your talk made me think of Olaf Stapleton's The Star Maker, which is a wonderfully eloquent statement of an animate cosmos, which if you've not read it, it's a very up book. Mm. It seems to me in terms of what you said, in terms of communication with other planets, probably... The, the SETI, the SETI program now, which is based on radio telescopes, heavy technology and stuff, is, I mean, maybe worth doing, but I myself don't think it will get very far. 
If we take this other approach, possibly involving psychedelics, there seem to be three points here. Firstly, uh, are we trying to communicate with beings of our own kind of level, i.e. biological type organisms on planets somewhere else in the universe? That would be a kind of peer conversation. And it may be that psychedelics would help that. It may be that shamanic journeyings into the heavens, which are a long part of a very long tradition, it may have gone on for hundreds of thousands of years. Those may have been contacting beings of that kind, of a similar order to ourselves. Then there's this thing that you rather dismissed, the communication with a higher kind of mind or intelligence, the Pacific Ocean, the sun, the solar system, the galaxy. Um, I think you dismissed it too soon, because in a sense the... The, the idea that our minds are very much smaller parts of a very much larger mental system incomprehensible to us because it's so much larger than our own uh, so much more inclusive and working on a different time scale and order of magnitude uh, this is of course a very traditional idea that our intelligence is lower in the scale than much higher ones but we can communicate with these higher levels of intelligence through prayer through uh, mystical insight or intuition um, we don't have to stay at our own level there are these possibilities most mystical insights are about contacting um, higher levels of being or higher levels of intelligence and most forms of mysticism today are extremely fuzzy because people uh, as soon as you get beyond the human level we lack maps I mean is it a sense of connection with a particular place you know the the earth of the California coast and the sea that we uh, the, lo the locality extending maybe 20 or 30 miles around us uh, a sense of absorption into the nature of that place or the whole planet earth or the solar system or the galaxy or the cluster of galaxies or the cosmos or God who may be a spirit uh, pervading the entire cosmos the unifying spirit of everything um, most people don't quite know where one leaves off and the next begins all they know is that it's bigger than them and it may be that uh, we're not in the past people may have had a better sense of just how far they were going I think these doctrines of hierarchies of angels um, was an attempt to recognize that there are many different levels of intelligence or mind uh, beyond our own